So my, my goal here for the next few minutes that we get to spend together is to answer two questions that are probably burning in your mind. The first is, uh, why am I holding a blue marble? <laughs> right, you've got yours. And why did a marine biologist get invited to come speak about water in the Sonoran Desert? So by the end of our time together, hopefully those, those two questions will be more than answered. I think it's somewhat obvious that from this map that the desert surrounds a sea. It doesn't always feel that way, especially when you step outside and it's, oh, 110 or 112 degrees, and all you see are, are cacti and mountains. So let's start here. Let's start with you. Take a, a moment and just don't overthink it, but consider this question. What's your water? What's your go-to water? And when did you fall in love with it? When did you fall completely head over heels in love with the way that water makes you feel? I know you know what I'm talking about. I know you're imagining your water right now. That water relationship may be very intimate. It may be the water that you needed literally to drink and bathe wherever you were, wherever maybe you lived, perhaps where you grew up. Or it could be a waterway that you go to with your best friend and you pretend that you're catching fish, but really you're there to spend time quietly together. Perhaps your water is a, a local waterway, maybe the Salt River. Maybe it's where you go to kayak and sometimes kayak past these wonderful wild mustangs. Maybe the bow of a boat is your water. And that's that time when the, the dolphins come and they stick with you for as long as they want to. It's their decision. Then they decide to leave, and they leave everybody with a huge smile on their face. Whatever our water is, we enjoy it most when we're there with those we love the most, our friends and our family. We're at the water, we're near it, we're in it, or we're under it together. Sometimes that relationship is facilitated by what we call the built environment. Buildings, piers, walkways, boardwalks, parks. Sometimes our water itself is the built environment. We put water in places in order to change the way that place feels, to elevate our spirits, to increase property value. This is here in Fountain Hills on Easter Sunday morning. What better place to gather than by the heart of this town, the lake and the fountain? For some people, their water is more domestic, maybe a rooftop pool with a negative edge in a city like Singapore. Looks pretty nice. Or an urban park a splash park, a place to go and play and just get wild and get crazy. Whether you're a kid or an adult, those splash parks are really fun. They boost our joy. For some people, it is much more intimate. <laughs> Their water is very domestic and very personal. Our friend Jack Black, that's his water. Likes to hang out with his puppy dog and eat eggs in the bath. Or maybe something very, very simple. The water fountain. Remember those? Before we had bottled water, we had water fountains. We stood in line at school, inching towards the water fountain, waiting for our chance to bend over, press the button, and luxuriate in that water stream. We felt like the king or the queen of the school when we, we got it, that, that spot, and we took as long as we needed to get hydrated. And sometimes it can be even much more subtle, just a drop of water in the right place at the right time can flip our mood, can change our perspective, can move us from scattered to mindful. So paying attention to the water that we interact day in and day out is important. For me personally, when I think of the water I love, I immediately think of my family, my mother, 
my father, my brother John, our aunts and uncles, and the abilities that they taught us, like swimming and diving, and the opportunities they afforded us, like traveling to wild waterways, to the rivers, to the lakes and the ponds, to the oceans of the world, to fall more deeply in love with that feeling, with ourselves, in fact, and with our water planet. But as a kid, I was really into turtles, sea turtles. And that was my pathway into exploring the ocean. I wanted to be like Jacques Cousteau. And I was told as a kid that he already had that job. It wasn't available. <laughs> Maybe you should pick something else. But I went to study in graduate school, of all places, to be a marine biologist at the University of Arizona. <laughs> Not the first place you probably were going to imagine I was going to say. Turns out Univers University of Arizona in Tucson has some of the leading scientists studying the Sea of Cortez, the Gulf of California in Mexico, the Sonoran Sea, the sea that has the desert wrapped around it. And among those scientists are some scientists who were some of the best sea turtle biologists in the world at the time. So while it doesn't seem so logical to become a marine biologist at the University of Arizona, it makes a little more sense than it seems just by the title. But while I was at U of A, I started to realize that to understand the wild, to work to restore wildlife and nature, we'd better understand ourselves. That seemed like an un unusual connection to make, but I started thinking more and more about human behavior, about neuroscience, about anthropology, and started to connect the dots between our neurons and the wild. We used to understand the brain as a black box. You could stimulate it and then see what happened, but you couldn't really tell what was going on inside the box. You had to infer based on what you did and what happened. The way we studied the brain was when people were done using their brains. We got to look at the brain and see what anomalies may have been there, what injuries, and compare that to their behavior. Very rudimentary. That's how neuroscience worked for hundreds of years. And then this technology came along that now allows us to look at our own brains in action while they're still in use, to understand the brain in different contexts, in the classroom, right? in the wild. We're able to ask different kinds of questions, questions about how we really live and how we interact with each other. It's an exciting time to be alive. It's an exciting time to be paying attention to the human brain. We have insights into the brain in motion and the brain at rest. And we can look at the differences. We're beginning to understand chemicals like oxytocin, which are the chemicals involved in building trust. The bonds of trust between us have a lot to do with oxytocin. So I, I looked around and, and I found that there's even the science of love. And I got really excited and started to talk really fast to my wife about the neuroscience of romance. <laughs> Turns out she's not that into it. <laughs> uh, there, this is just a sidebar, a little bit of advice. Um, some people are really into the neuroscience and get geeky about it, and some people aren't. There's a time and a place to get super geeky about the brain. Uh, today is my anniversary, and that's why I'm, I'm lingering on that a little bit. My wife, my wife doesn't think it's so interesting. I think it's super sexy, so we figured, <laughs> we figured that out. But I began to look around, and I saw that neuroscientists were looking at the science of meditation, the science of magic, even how magicians and illusionists fool you into thinking they're magicians, our brain's ability to change itself, the science of happiness, imagine, imagination, and on and on, the science of, neuroscience of economics, you go to that section of the, of the bookstore and you find a long list of interesting books on applied neuroscience, social neuroscience, interpersonal neuroscience. It's a booming industry. What I didn't find there was a book about our brain on water. This generation has the equivalent of a user's guide to our brain. That's exciting. That's a big idea. That has massive implications for how we live our lives. 
how we make new laws, how we treat each other, how we build our systems. But we need to extend it outside, outside of the room, outside of the classroom, outside of the laboratory, and begin to think about what neuroscience means for us in our relationship to nature. And from my perspective, in particular, water, the single biggest feature of our planet, the single biggest feature of our bodies, and water makes up 80% of our brains. Kind of important, but missing from that bookshelf. So I tried to convince a neuroscience friend to write that book, and they didn't. And so I tried to convince others to write it, and they didn't. So by default, I ended up writing it myself. A marine biologist writing about neuroscience. It took five years, very um, tedious, but exciting. And exciting because we are a water planet, but it's a bit of an illusion when you look at the Earth from space. That large marble represents all of the water, even the salty stuff. The smaller marble represents the fresh water, and the teeny tiny marble that you can barely see represents the accessible fresh water. Think about that. The perspective is humbling. We live in a, an era where we're competing for water. It's increasingly scarce or polluted, and some people say the wars of the future will be fought over water, not oil. We live in an era when we're more and more connected. There's more information. There's more news coming at us 24-7. Some people wake up in the morning, the first thing they do is check their email. It's also the last thing they do before they close their eyes. And they fill their days being hyper-connected. We know that creates problems. At its extreme, it creates stress. Extreme stress is, is, sometimes leads us to a post-traumatic stress situation. That's not good. Moderate chronic stress is bad. Extreme stress can, can really take us out of the game, break us apart. I refer to that stress situation as red mind. We're under stress, we're distracted, we're agitated. We're not our best selves. We're not our kindest selves, and we're not our most creative selves. We're in stress mode, red mind mode. Contrast that to blue mind, which is the way we feel when we step up to the edge of the water. That water that you thought of when I asked you that question. Your go-to water. Maybe it's the, the, the fountain lake. Maybe it's the salt river. Maybe it's down in, in Mexico. Maybe it's the Pacific coast. Maybe it's Jack Black's bathtub. <laughs> So I hope not. I hope. <laughs> so this is not a new idea. Um, a, an, an unnamed, um, moderately average beer company in Mexico <laughs> made a, a killing selling their beer by using Blue Mind. Remember those first ads? 30 seconds, just a single shot of the ocean, the sound of the waves. No dialogue, no people, just the beer in the ocean. Advertisers thought, wow, that's a waste of money. Nope, it worked. Why did it work? Because it felt good. We connected their brand with that feeling, and it worked. And they continued to do that. Even the new ads still play on that basic theme. Hollywood is onto this. There's that moment. Remember that, that movie? Little Leo DiCaprio, back in the day, up in the bow of the ship, arms in the air with his buddy, saying, what? I'm king of the world best version of himself. Now, I'm not going to continue with the Titanic story because it doesn't end well and it doesn't, su <laughs> doesn't support my thesis at all. But there was this moment there on the bow that was really good, wasn't it? One of the great moments of cinematic history, along with this one, some of you will remember, From Here to Eternity. Remember that scene? Now, imagine that scene, exactly the same, same swimsuits, but remove the water. Two people in their swimsuits rolling in the dirt. <laughs> Not so good. No Academy Awards. Not a history-making scene. Actually, kind of creepy, really. <laughs> ask, your, ask your lover if they want to go outside and roll around in the dirt later. I bet they say no. I hope they say no. Not so comfortable. Really terrible, actually. Cities 
founded, Modesto, California, founded on this basic idea, water and wealth and contentment, happiness and health are all intertwined. They're all, this is a hundred-year-old sign built by the same people who built the Golden Gate Bridge as you enter Modesto, California. They thought enough of the connection between these concepts to put it on the archway going into their city. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, not well known for its healthy waterways, but they're making a comeback. The city is investing in restoring the rivers. It's changing the way people live in Pittsburgh. Kids are now dropping kayaks in their rivers. People are going to the edge of water to propose to each other, to eat lunch, to hold ceremonies. Real estate values are going up along the water. Very interesting. Plain and simple, water is medicine. Another ancient idea, thousand-year-old idea. Water is medicine if it's healthy and accessible. If you could put it in a pill, it might come with a warning label that would say, may cause happiness, <laughs> could reduce your heart rate, may connect you deeply with those you love. Wouldn't that be great? It doesn't come in a pill, but it's out there. Free, free medicine. Oliver Sacks, one of the great neurologists of our time who recently passed away, says he gets his best ideas. And the guy is a good idea, was a good idea, factory. Many best-selling books, brilliant man. Gets his best ideas while in the water, while swimming. So he always kept a pad on the dock or on the table or on the edge of the pool so he could download his good ideas. I'll introduce you to a few other people to illustrate these, these main points about water. Martin Pollock, a veteran from Afghanistan, came back with no legs and one arm. He said he may end up sitting in the bar on a stool with his buddies, drinking his life away, becoming a blob. Those are his words. But he got hooked up with a program called Operation Surf and got connected with the water. And that's happening all over our nation on the lakes and the rivers and the oceans. And he caught a wave, and he liked the feeling. He liked the camaraderie. And now Martin is a warrior for the ocean. He's helping other people connect with their waterways, and he's fighting to keep the ocean clean. We need people like Martin on our team for the ocean and for each other. And the guy is trained as a warrior. He just needs a new cause, and he's got one now. This is Jarmila. She's a Czechoslovakian immigrant. She was put in a nursing home late in her life after retiring from UCLA, where she was a professor of art. And she was forgotten, as can happen. My friend Greg went over and, and was introduced to her. She's friends with his wife. And he learned that she used to love the ocean. She was suffering from Alzheimer's and beginning to, to slip away. He took her out of the nursing home in his car, and they went to the sea. She stood up out of her wheelchair, shuffled towards the railing, and held on. And Greg said, Jarmila, I didn't know you could walk. She said, I haven't had anything worth walking to until now, her beloved ocean. That's what these waters are for us. They're medicine. They work that way. They give us awe, these waterways. And they give us wonder. Imagine life without awe and wonder. Vastly diminished. We need awe and wonder. We find awe in the water. What does awe do? It flips us from a me perspective, a self-focused perspective, to a we perspective. There's research that shows that the feeling of awe creates a neurological cascade that boosts our compassion, that builds trust. It reduces harmful chemicals in our bodies like cortisol and cytokines that get in the way of healing because they promote inflammation. Real science, some of the hardest science in the room. Our water promotes creativity. 
I made a little film with Pharrell Williams. He said, I got my rhythm and my music from water, from the ocean. And he took that all the way to the bank, man. I mean, that guy made some, <laughs> mu some music and some money off of that love of water and that rhythm. So think about that. Water gives us solitude. Standing at the edge of the lake out there at night just gives you a break. And solitude is becoming a more, ra more rare commodity, harder and harder to find. And along with that solitude, privacy. When you want it, you don't want to be on camera. You don't want to be connected. You want to be truly alone. Try the water. Slip into your water. Go to the edge of your water. Of course, romance is often associated with water. I proposed to my wife underwater. We got married next to the water. That's just part of, of how we live. I talked to Jay Schlum about it, and he said, yeah, some of those, you know, the, the high schoolers end, end their dates out by the, by the lake, overlooking the lake. People propose to each other out by the lake. People hold their ceremonies where they pledge their love for each other out by the lake and at the end of life celebrate lives out by the lake, memorial services. Water gives us relaxation, and that's critical because stress is implicated in 60% of modern diseases and healthcare concerns. 60% are connected to stress. If you have a free, available, accessible way to reduce stress, use it. If it's out your back door, you're lucky. Water gives us nostalgia. Those places that we think of fondly, like dots throughout our lives, those moments with the water from childhood right up perhaps till yesterday. And at the core of it all is love. It's about falling deeper in love with our waterways, ourselves, and those around us, and generating more compassion and empathy for all of the above. That's my girl Grace, by the way. I always got to get a photo of the kids in there. So let's bring it back home a little bit here, the Sonoran Desert. Hopefully it's become clear why I'm talking about water here in the desert. My love of water grew here in the Sonoran Desert, not just by the ocean, but also here in Fountain Hills, walking with my parents around the lake, running laps with my brother, hanging out with the family, with my, nieces and my niece and nephew, my sister-in-law. It's a great place. That fountain is the heart. Now, when we don't have access to water, we lose a lot more than hydration, hygiene, and jobs. We lose all those emotional benefits. So I was completely enthralled with this process the Colorado River runs dry at its end where it enters the Gulf of California, the Sonoran Sea. But a group of people worked very hard to release a flow. And look what happened. Same river, a few days later, ran with water. And what did that mean? A whole generation of Mexican families got to experience what their wild river looks like and feels like and tastes like. Not forever, it was a bit of an experiment, but adults got to introduce their kids to their river, the one in their backyard that they had never seen for a whole generation. Think about that when you turn on the tap here in the desert. We are connected by our water. I think we have a lesson to teach the world here in the desert about water, about what it's really worth, the true value of water. And here in Fountain Hills, people know a thing or two about the emotional value of water. The people who started this town also brought the London Bridge to Arizona. <laughs> Why would you do that? <laughs> it's so cool, though. 
And why is it cool? Because it goes over water. Again, imagine sand under that bridge. Not so interesting. It's about the water. It's spectacular. It's magical. It's provocative. It's mysterious. It's romantic. It's the place where you write poetry and you get big thoughts. Fountain Hills began with a big idea in the desert. A fountain, the world's tallest, continuously running fountain, 560 feet into the air. Big jet engines underground, shooting that water up. Using reclaimed water to be sustainable and responsible. And then the community began to grow. After the fountain came, the name Fountain Hills is provocative. It has, I, I feel cooler just saying it. <laughs> On a hot day, I just say to myself, Fountain Hills, and I feel two degrees cooler instantly. <laughs> it's amazing. You look out your window and you see it and you feel better. I interviewed Jay Schlum and he said, yes, the property values go up if you have a view of the fountain. That adds to the value of this town. This, the trails, this town is full of trails. The trails around the fountain are the most walked. The highest level of recreation is around the fountain. There are beautiful trails off through the desert. Lovely, lovely plants. But there's no water. I love plants, by the way. But walking around water is where it's at. So the last thing I want to discuss is that blue marble in your pocket or in your bag. It's a simple gift from us to you, meant to remind you of our intimate human relationship with water. It's a simple token of gratitude that is meant to be carried, but given away. So when the feeling or the idea strikes you, please pass your blue marble on to someone. We ask that you give it to someone that you perhaps haven't said thank you to in a while, maybe never, that deserves some gratitude, some overdue gratitude. Because these simple gifts, the simple thank yous, the simple bits of gratitude are much more powerful than we realize. They boost oxytocin, which boosts trust, builds connection, builds community. So pass your blue marble to someone, ask them to do the same. Tell your version of this story, your blue marble story. When you hold it up, that's what we look like from a million miles away. The astronauts who took the first photograph of our whole planet called that photograph the blue marble. And it's the most reproduced photograph of all time. Think about that. Why? Because it's home. We love our home. Sometimes we don't act like it, but we do. We got one. We're not going to get to the next planet anytime soon. This is it, folks. So cherish your blue marble. Build community through gratitude. And thank you for inviting me to share a little bit about water with here in Fountain Hills. Thanks.